Well, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to such a beautiful city. I appreciate being here. Um, I'm going to be talking about a subset of innovation following Akhil's much broader sense. And this is how you build uh, companies, mostly building companies, but also bringing technology to existing companies based on research, based on academic research. Now, MIT's academic research is about $700 million a year. So we're talking about a lot of research, but how do you translate that into innovation and economic development? So we'll go with that. Uh, but first, I have to figure out how to work it. OK, when we use the term technology transfer, it's, it's very broadly used. It's everything from the papers that faculty write to consulting from professors. And probably the most important is the graduating student at the state of the art going into companies. Um, Bob Brown, who used to be our provost, um, but is now president of Boston University, used to say that technology transfers best in objects that wear shoes. But for the purpose of this thing, we're going to take a more formal look at it, if I get the direction right. And this is the formal definition of tech transfer, which is the purposeful transfer of the results of academic basic research into industry via outlicensing of intellectual property. Because what we're trying to do is to go from research to the inventions that can come out of it, to development, and then to innovation so that you can bring new products and medicines and technology into economic competitiveness and also encourage entrepreneurship, which we all start to recognize as the major source of growth in economies. The hard step is the second arrow of going from innovation to development. Universities stop when they have the science completed and the inventions made. And it's going to take a great deal of investment to, uh, to get there. So the primary purpose of this licensing is to transfer the technology into the economy and into innovation. A lot of people think the tech transfer is about royalties and making a lot of money for the university. I'm going to come back to this later, but my, the bottom line is no. It doesn't on the whole, statistically. And therefore, it needs support from the university and the government. The United States started it with the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. Right, still to this day, the majority, almost 90% of the research in American universities and research hospitals is funded by the federal government. And what was happening was the US was leading the world in uh, science, but it wasn't translating into industry. What the Bayh-Dole Act did is it said that the universities, rather than the government, would own the patents that came out of the inventions of university research. And it allowed the universities to grant licenses so that tech transfer happened at the local level, not at the governmental level. Because what had happened before is there were a fair number of patents but they were sitting in file cabinets in dusty government offices and nothing was happening. It also allowed exclusive licenses. That, and I'm going to go into why that's important, that you would be able to give a patent to one company. And it said that the universities could take royalties. And it legislated that part of the royalties, it didn't say what fraction, would be shared with the inventors personally to give academics the incentives to participate in this process. As I said, the reason primarily was that the research results were not being translated into innovation. And at that time, the, we were very concerned about economic competitiveness in the US, thinking that Japan was going to destroy our economy. But obviously, that didn't happen. What, why vital? The issue was the recognition that university inventions are very early, embryonic. The, their feasibility for scale up, 
for practicality, for being able to be uh, made at a reasonable price. And even the more innovative it was, who would want it? Who would want, maybe a few thousand people would want a photocopying <laughs> machine? Who would want a computer in their home? So you cannot predict the future. So development, the in investment in development from university stage was going to be a high risk investment. No guarantee that it would work. The idea then was to use patents, which can say that if the company is successful in that risk, then it can protect itself from its competitors coming in second. And so this was the primary importance of, the, of having patents on university research and being able to grant exclusive licenses the idea being the whole thing is about inducing investment in development. Now, it varies by sector. It isn't, it's sometimes important in software, but not very much, usually. But if you take something like um, pharmaceuticals, if you don't have a patent, you're not going to have a product. And that's because the time frames for development are so long. The, financial investment so high, high failure rate even when you get to clinical trials, so that the probability is very high. Without a patent to protect it, nobody's going to invest in it. But it's not just pharmaceuticals. It's anything that's going to take a long time and a lot of money and that is radically new. So you're talking about things like new materials with superconductors, or three-dimensional printing, or new forms of desalination, and occasionally a software, such as public key encryption, which was a very important MIT patent, and it was important for the 20 years life of that patent. Obviously, the benefits to the university are to bring the research to the public, get the technology developed, get the public recognizing why they're paying for our research. But another one that is underestimated is the importance of allowing the scientists to see the real world results of their research. Many projects go on for 15 or 20 years before they are launched into potential development. But the opportunity to say, I cured somebody, or I made a huge difference in how the world communicates is highly motivating. And of course, for the university, it brings real world products, knowledge, et cetera, back into the university so that our students learn to think about those kind of things. And graduates often go to work for it. There's indirect financial benefit in that it, knowing what you're doing with intellectual property helps bring financial s support from industry for our research and you get philanthropy, and very importantly, economic development locally and nationally. But let's talk about the money. This is data from the Association of University Technology Managers, 200 research intensive universities, all the top universities reporting. In the fiscal year 2009, they had 3,400 patents issue, 4,300 new agreements, almost 600 startup companies, and historically they had 3,400 new companies still active. But you look at the revenue, it looks like a lot of money. This was the total revenue for the year, until you divide it by the research base. And you're showing that even after 30 years after Baidol, the total was on less than 5% of the research expenditures. My message being tech transfer will not support your research programs unless you get very lucky. And that's this slide. Of that $2.3 billion, Six universities accounted for half of it. So it's a lottery game. If you win the lottery, you do very well for a while 
until your patent expires, and then you're best down in the weeds with the rest of us. So it's an e easy conclusion that it can't be in it for the money. But the social impact is really much larger. 4,000 companies formed an estimated 500,000 jobs only working on either development or manufacturing of products licensed from university technology. Significant tax returns to the government and many new products, new medicines, new cures. And a significant number of big startups have happened. Things like Google from Stanford, Akamai from MIT, Cubist Pharmaceuticals, which was one of our startups. And in both the Bay Area and, and particularly now in the Boston area, clusters of specific industries. There are more than 350 biotech companies in the Boston region, more than half of which spun directly out of a university, a university or hospital. Another key one, and this is a benefit that's hard to quantify, but is a key element. At MIT, it's almost part of our brand of why we are doing tech transfer, because it's this awareness of spin-outs that's now happening around the country, many successful role models. Uh, and what one of the things we found is that our business school curriculum changed. We had a uh, our Sloan School had been primarily, even when I went there, primarily focused on large industry, financial returns, that kind of thing. Very little, very, very little on entrepreneurship. But the, all of the spin-outs and the publicity from the technology parts of MIT, the science, were leading to a self-selection by the MBA students who were demanding education and entrepreneurship. And now that entrepreneurship track of our MBA is by far the oversubscribed track. Um, and things happen within the universities. But the other thing is you start having people come visit. Venture capitalists and entrepreneurs saying, what's new, what's going on, where can I get involved? OK, we've been involved in, for a long time in um, technology commercialization patenting a little bit going back to the 1930s. We were reorganized in 86, and our uh, staff is primarily people, the senior staff, people with strong science or engineering backgrounds who have also spent a decade or two in industry before coming back. And we went from about eight licenses a year to now close to 100. We start a lot of companies, it goes up, it goes down, it depends a little, no, it depends a lot on the economy and the optimism of investors. Um, but people say, why all this emphasis on spin-outs as opposed to going to a large company and saying, how would you like my new invention that came out of Pro Professor Nobel Laureate's <laughs> laboratory? We try that, it just doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of the reluctance of established large companies to take the risk that I was talking about. It's partly the risk and therefore the possibility of failure and who gets blamed, but it's also that it's too long a time to market. It's not within the time frame. You're not gonna have a product for 10 to 12 years that large companies can tolerate nowadays. It also requires specialized resources, and as the large companies have pulled back on their research staff dramatically, and even on their development staff, they don't have the people to take on the technology at this stage. They do want new, big companies want new, but they don't want early. And so what has happened is that the spin-out companies have become the bridge between university inventions and the big companies. The, they, the new companies, the spin-outs or startups, I use the term interchangeably because startups is American, spin-outs European and, and British. Um, 
they've been filling the gap. And they lessen the risk because they mature the technology. And then the large companies that are willing to pay a great deal of money to those who succeed. So you end up with a chain of value with the federal government uh, funding the basic research because that is not profitable over a, a, a even reasonable time horizon. Out of that research where the university does the research leads to invention, we file a patent on it, and then the formation of a spin-out company to which we grant an exclusive license. The venture investment, be it angel, venture capital firms, other high-risk investors are funding the spin-out company. And if they develop the product to the point where the big company can see that it will be going into manufacturing sales fairly soon, the big companies, and you can see this happen in pharmaceuticals, buying out biotech companies or buying products in the hundreds of millions of dollars per transaction. So you get that chain of value with the spin of companies, so they have become critical to our technology transfer. Yes, we occasionally do license to large companies, and there are some small pat patents that may get multiple non-exclusive, but it's becoming clear that spin-out companies, entrepreneurship, are our major route. Now, why are we able to do so much, spinning out an average of about 20 licensed companies a year? Now, many more companies come out of MIT than the licensed companies. Uh, student companies, faculty forming companies that aren't using MIT intellectual property, but these are just the licensed companies. First of all, we have a lot of research, as I said. We have good IP protection. We have enough of a patent budget that we can take a chance on filing a patent on anything that looks like it has a halfway decent chance of spinning out. We're not trying to cherry pick. Uh, we've got very clear, very simple policies on IP ownership. We don't make exceptions. So it doesn't matter if I say no, you can go to my boss and she'll say no too, which is very important. And uh, from the top of MIT, my job is not to bring in maximum money. My job is to have maximum impact on uh, what we are doing. It also helps to be around for a long time and so that people know what they're doing. But a key element also is the entrepreneurial ecosystem that has developed both outside MIT and I'll come into the details inside MIT. We're in a highly entrepreneurial network environment. Boston is a big, small town. Everybody knows everybody, and people like Akil are helping that happen even more than it used to. Uh, but we've been doing it a long time. Uh, my first job out of MIT was my professor's startup company. So was my husband's first job. So, uh, and some of you have probably heard of the companies. The biologists will know Amicon, and the rest of you will know Bose Corporation. And then the many activities within the universities where outside world is mixing with us. Uh, things like the Deshpande Center, which will give a grants specifically, not to companies, but to projects within MIT that look like another year or two, uh, they'll be able to spin out. And there too, and I'm gonna come back to Akhil, there too, we take advantage and have for many, many years of the investors, entrepreneurs, big company executives who will come in and act as judges for the projects and then will mentor the projects over the year or two that they are being funded. A student business plan contest, it says student because it has to have students as part of the team, but many of them get funded. A venture mentoring service in which it's now 150 volunteers from that same business investment entrepreneur community will mentor any entrepreneur associated with MIT, or in this case, even MIT alums, who are thinking of starting a company, have started a company, need advice and connections. 
Okay, now my clicker isn't working. Okay, an enterprise forum which basically networking and case studies on small and on growing companies. It's been around for 35 years, has a couple of meetings a month. The Entrepreneurship Center, which will take in for the summer uh, proje uh, student projects, a lot of undergrads, some grad students, and a much wider range of technologies since it doesn't have to be based on intellectual property, nor do the rest of these except for the Deshpande Center. And then a zillion clubs in venture and mentoring. Every one of them is drawing on the community of investors, entrepreneurs, company executives, so that our students are con continuously exposed to those people. If you're an undergraduate for four years in our place, you're gonna meet 20 people who've started companies among your, just the people within the university, even if you don't try. If you try, you're gonna meet a lot more. So what happens is that there's a lot of role models. And a very important part of our purpose is that students are saying, it isn't rare, you don't have to be Superman or Bill Gates to start a company. One of these days, I'm gonna do it too. So it changes student ambitions. Okay, I wanna go in for just a few minutes to what I've learned anyway uh, of how do you start building a system like this? Now, Spain isn't just starting, but I think the components are still relevant. One, you have to have good research consistently supported over long periods of time because these inventions are not made in, in a year's time. You have to have within the country, and we have not as much problems in Europe as you do some other countries, a consistently supported intellectual property system, which means consistent court system, et cetera. But it also is, why are you doing it? And are the time frames realistic? Too many places, both within the United States, many states do it, and elsewhere say, well, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna support it for five years. Well, at the end of five years, you're gonna see hints of success. And the last, do the universities know why they're doing it? If they're expecting it to support them to get rich, ever, Almost everybody except the lottery winners will be disappointed. You also need very clear policies within the university. Who owns the intellectual property? What are faculty allowed to do outside the university? What are they allowed to do within the university? For example, MIT has a strict rule that you cannot incubate your company within your laboratories. But other places it's allowed, that's fine. But they've got to be consistent, because otherwise every potential deal turns into a committee meeting, which is not really highly conducive to entrepreneurship. It takes money to build a patent portfolio so that investors will be coming to you and saying, what have you got? It may take a long time to make that money back. Uh, where are the funds going to come from? The US, we've shown that on an average, it takes about 10 years from its beginning for a tech transfer office to become fully functioning and just barely operating in the black. If you starve them of money, then they operate in the black and do very little. If, you, if they're sufficiently funded, then they can support themselves and do many good things. But only a few lucky ones will get rich. What I've also found is that tech transfer is a talent-based endeavor, the people doing it. It's not only the technical training, but a, a kind of philosophy where they're bilingual between the language of university with its emphasis on discovery and publication and on industry with its emphasis on profit essentially, but also how are decisions made in industry. They also have to be smart enough to command the respect of faculty who some of the time start with the idea that anyone who's not faculty is an idiot and you prove otherwise, but they can prove otherwise. 
they have to handle complexity. None of the jobs, none of the projects are easy. They all have some complicated problem that needs to be teased out. They have to be good communicators in both senses of the word, not only the ability to talk and write, but the ability to listen and see what people are really saying. Good negotiators and dedicated to the mission. And then I think both Akhil and I have been talking about a supportive ecosystem where the university and the business people interact in the educational aspect of it, role models. Uh, one of my favorite uh, successful philanthropic entrepreneurs, Ray Stata, who founded Analog Devices. It's wonderful when he talks to students because the first thing he does is tell them about the two companies that he started that failed and what he learned from them. And this allows people to understand that risk is part of the game. Failure is not a black mark, it's a learning experience. Some proof of concept support is often needed. Our Deshpandi Center has that, and the ability to network with people who've done it. And the final requirement is time. It takes time and investment to build the portfolio of intellectual property that anyone's interested, time to develop the skill of tech transfer within the university. You can't learn this in school. And developing the contacts with industry, investors, and developing trust among investors and entrepreneurs. And then the ability to start to build an entrepreneurial culture both within and outside the universities. And uh, that's my story. Thank you. Thank you.